pollination between uh, uh, Canada and uh, the rest of the Americas, particularly Latin America, um, these uh, webinars uh, were, uh, have been the result of uh, discussions that came out of the International Commission on Plant Pollinator Relations uh, meetings that were held in Cholula at the International Pollination Symposium a couple of years ago um, then in Mexico and it was decided at that point that there was a, um, a lot of interest in sharing technology and sharing problems and interests from, uh, from uh, south to north. So uh, today we're going to talk about oil seeds and crop pollination in Canada and in Latin America. And we're very pleased to have uh, with us today then uh, Dr. Bettina Blochtein and Ms. Ros uh, Rosanna Halinski uh, from Rio Grande do Sul, uh, who have done a lot of work with uh, particularly canola pollination in that part of the world and are going to speak first. And then uh, I will be making my presentation uh, after that. Each presentation is about 15 minutes and uh, you're welcome to uh, type in questions as we go through in the chat box and we'll answer those as we go along and then at the end we'll have about 15 minutes for uh, uh, people to ask some questions to discuss things back and forth and uh, the speakers will be able to answer questions uh, uh, verbally then at that time. So without any further ado, then I'll call on um, uh, Bettina uh, to give the uh, first talk. Hello, everybody. It's nice to take part in this webinar. I'm talking from Brazil uh, and let me see here my presentation aqui just a moment please aqui não 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 tá aí um outro qual outro mano let me see here okay thank you uh, here in Brazil we have some oil seed plants like you can see here but today I will talk just about canola, the Canadian oil low acid. This is the third produced oil plant worldwide. And here, and especially in south of Brazil, the canola represents in the last years an economic crop uh, option, alternative, and especially for crop rotation. Uh, the canola production is concentrated in south of Brazil and uh, we are studying here some points and because pollination in agricultural scale depends on the cultivar and the environmental conditions. Uh, here the canola planted is from, from Iola group, they are hybrids not GM plants and uh, we studied three Iola cultivars uh, and in these three uh, hybrids we have a antesis uh, during uh, between 12 until 48 hours this is the time when the flower are open in this time the pistil length increase, the pollen grain viability varies between 42 to 100 percent, the stigma receptive, but most anthers face the flower exterior, face the petals of the flowers, and in this moment the bees can pollinate a lot, the bees are important. As we all know, the pollination by, by bees increases grain yield in some different contexts. We can uh, note that the uh, increase of the amounts of silics, pods, and seeds, produ and seeds production. 
the seed weight and the seed quality can increase too and so the oil production in these cases with bees can produce more biofuel and cooking oil. But how much are the bees contributing to the canola yield in Brazil? That's the point. Uh, we saw that the percentage of pod formation from canola flowers in southern, in southern Brazil increased between 15 to 32 percent with bees. The number of seeds per pot increases to between 0.5 to 4.4 percent. The seed weight compared to the results of the number of the pods per plant and the seeds per pod uh, gives differences but a little bit smaller. Um, the bees activity, the bees fly activity when the bees pollinate, now the pollination in seeds uh, can vary in a subtropical weather. Na, and especially in fall, winter, crop as canola that are flowering uh, in this time, June to September, uh, we have here low temperatures. And in this time, some bees species are in diapause and uh, because these two points, the fly activity of the bees is limited to some hours a day and they are flying just in the uh, hours, in the time when the temperature is higher as we can see here that uh, at 1 p.m. we have, we have, we see, we, we can see more activity than earlier or uh, later. Another point is the relationships between landscapes and the pollinators. Uh, in this picture we are showing the agricultural uh, landscape, landscape here in South Brazil, where we have an intensive agriculture. And then consequently we have a homogeneous landscape and a big loss of bee, bee populations. Then uh, the uh, pollination service are low, relative low. In this map here, we can see the yellow color. Here is the most part of the figure. The, this yellow part shows us the agricultural areas. Here we are, we have some circles here on and each group of circles are showing an uh, analysis that we, we did in a landscape around canola fields in different radius from 500 meters, 1000 meters and 2000 meters around canola fields. This as, uh, uh, sorry, uh, in this uh, yellow part, as I show you, we have a dominance of agricultural areas. In numbers, these agricultural areas in different radius, in 500,000 and 2,100, represent between 84% to 92% of agricultural areas. So in this case, we have not so much friendly areas for the bee's survival. Then, consequently, the insect's richness in these canola fields are very low. Apis mellifera is the dominant species with about 80% of all collected insects. We have some native bees too, representing 4% and other insects. In this case, when the, uh, where the insect density were low, 
we could not fi found a relationship between insect density and the rate of fruit sets and number of pods per plant and seeds per pod. But together, all this, uh, uh, these components can reflect in a seed weight per plant. In this case, we can uh, find a positive relationship between insect density and uh, seed weight per plant. So, as general conclusions and perspectives, we can say that the pollination increases the yield of the three canola cultivars in Brazil. The canola growers aren't using bees for pollination, not yet, unfortunately. And the only abundant pollinator we detected was Apis mellifera. Another point is the low bee richness and the density in canola fields are related with the season for winter and landscapes dominated by agricultural areas. So, we should provide suitable habitats for native bees and promote pollinator-friendly measures to the maintaining bee population and we should introduce stingless bees and apis mellifera hives in canola fields during flowering periods. So we are, I will say that we are taking part in a Brazilian pollinating network with many stakeholders as you can see here. And it was our message. Thank you so much. I will be here to to uh, respond some uh, questions that uh, I, I hope will come. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tina. We'll go straight on to uh, Hosanna's uh, presentation now and uh, have a look at a different aspect of uh, the um, importance of pollination on uh, canola production in, uh, in southern Brazil. So, Hosanna. Thank you, Peter, for the invitation. I will talk today about bee assemblage, seed production and economic value of canola in southern Brazil. The first topic is the assemblage in canola fields. The aim of this work, the, this paper, was knowledge the potential pollinators in agriculture areas for the establish, establishment of strategies to increase the productivity. So this is our study area in Esmeralda City, in South Brazil, Grande do Sul. This is the four fields that uh, we study. This is the image of the area. Here, flowering canola fields, forest vegetation, and grassland vegetation. These three habitats were collected one year and I will present some numbers. 886 species of bees was collected. Sorry, individuals with 87 species. Apid was the family most important with 441 individuals, of which 254 is Apis mellifera. The second family most was Alictid, with, with 424 individuals, and the other with a low number. About bees in habitats, we, we know the grassland vegetation and the flowering canola fields was the most collected, most sampling here. 
Here is, is a sample of the list of bees collected in, here in South Brazil. Some topics up for discussion is about uh, exclusively. In flowering canola fields, there are eight species exclusively, grassland vegetation, 51 species, forests, fragments, six, six species, and only eight species is, uh, are present in all habitats, especially four of these species are native social bees. Bombus poloensis, Morella cerulea, Scaptorigona bipuntata, and Trigona spinips. These species are very common here. But most species samples was categorized as rare. In this graph, you can see the frequency of guilds here in different habitats. For example, in the flowering canola field, the, the first, almost half of the bees collected was Apis mellifera. But if you look, the social native bees that have an uh, interest to management here, Uh, Rosanna, uh, we've lost uh, our video and audio connection with you, so if you could pause until we get it back, that would be very helpful. Thank you. I don't, there's no way to know. Oh, I can turn my audio on. I try to turn on again. Can you hear me now? We're back. Well, yeah, we're we're back. Uh, we can see you now. Okay. Uh, what slide? I you, you saw me. The last. The last slide. Here. The discussion, Victoria? Yes, the very start of this slide. OK. I'm talking about the results of the B assemblage. So this slide shows some numbers of the, the collector of bees. And here you can see the, the results of flowering canola fields. And the, the low number of the richness is because of the high abundance and dominance of apes mellifera and the rare bees collected in the forest fragments is because of the low luminosity and the interference in the efficacy of plant traps suggest the best capture include the other methodology entomological nets and chemical baits or others and the second family most uh, collected was halictid and was known in the literature the dominance of these species in open or secondary vegetation can uh, explain why we capture a lot and the plant traps maximize of sampling of these species. So 
The discussion the, of this topic is, is almost about the loss or mischaracterization of forest environment, reduce the abundance of the and the diversity of bees, in consequence, do a modification of plant pollination interaction network, reducing the pollination service. So, the expansion of agriculture areas to compensate a pollination deaths might result in a loss of forest and grassland habitats associated with canola fields, possibly reducing the richness of bees that promoted the, uh, uh, the highest productivity. The second topic I will talk about is the effect of distance from forest fragments on seed production and the economic value of this service. Here, here is an image of this displays. Here are flowering in the distance in that I harvest the plants. Uh, we harvest the plants in parcels of 225 meters square and extrapolate to one hectare. And the price of the canola sack here is 41 hats. Here is a summer in this table that we countabilize, and here I'm, I make a point in the weight uh, of 1,000 seeds that you can compare with the other papers. Uh, as you can see in this table, in the four fields, you can, you can see a decrease in the number of the seeds. If you look better in this, in this graph, only the productivity, you can see the distance from forest fragments reduce the, the seeds in the field 1, field 2, especially in the field 3, where the higher difference of productivity was 2,700, and this value of this number is 113,000 reais. It's a lot for a producer, especially if a small producer that can uh, that is common here. This in this table you can see the income hectare and the total income for field that have from forest fragments to interior of the flowering canola fields can reduce a lot like here in these arrows, and when you look better, only the total loss per field, you can sum all these values, like here, can you see the, the slide picture, and you sum the total loss, it's about 350,000 reais. It's a big loss for year of this producer with the four fields. In, uh, for example, in Canada, the mean productivity of canola hybrids is 4,500 kilograms per hectare. But here in Brazil, the producers, uh, the mean of the, the produ production here is 1,600. It's uh, a low, a low process to to increase. Maybe you can provide some points to uh, pro promote this, in, uh, this increase. And the, in this present study with the, the IOLA, uh, the productivity exceeds these values, the mean, and in the distance closest to forest fragments, indicating that uh, the maintenance of forest areas for pollination is essential to increase seed production. And taking, a, taking into account sorry, the expansion of agriculture area to, to compensate for the productivity deficit of canola, the maintenance of these forest fragments is suggested to provide favorable conditions for the permanence of pollinators. So, you can increase the seed production and the economic value associated with this service. 
Thank you very much for the invitation and I'm open to questions in email and here later. Thank you very much for that interesting presentation, Hosanna. Um, I think there are a number of lessons that we can learn from, from that and uh, um, some of the um, references that you gave and uh, that uh, Bettina gave have uh, illustrate the importance of uh, pollination for oilseed production in canola in Canada. Um, so I'm not going to I'm going to talk about uh, mostly the hybrid seed production side of things in Canada because that's uh, where Hyola comes from um, as a hybrid seed uh, rather than for the uh, standard um, crushing site seed which we've heard about from Brazil. I'm also going to talk a little bit about mustard and sunflower, safloy, uh, safflower, uh, soy flax and corn as the other uh, oil seeds that are produced in Canada. So we'll start first of all with looking at uh, canola in a general sense. Now, which button? It's not going down. Down here. This is next. Okay. Okay. Um, Canada is really uh, the world uh, major producer of of uh, canola, commodity canola. Um, it's the world leader, and here gives some figures that uh, <clears throat> the millions of hectares which are in produced production in Canada uh, versus in the world. Um, so uh, these are figures up until about 2009, and uh, canola production has been increasing since. You can see from the map that canola production is mostly in Manitoba, Saskatchewan, and in Alberta. Um, and there are some uh, other areas of production, but no, certainly nothing like as important. This gives us some idea of the millions of tons which are coming off Canadian fields in commodity canola. So this is going to, uh, going to the mills to be crushed for oil and uh, the other seed components are used in different ways as animal feed and so on. And uh, one can see that the uh, production has been going up very, very fast by comparison with with soybeans and flaxseed, um, and the value of that has really just been uh, uh, skyrocket skyrocketing in recent years. Um, we know that almost all canola cultivars are self-compatible. They have been bred uh, for self-compatibility by the, by the uh, plant breeders, um, and self-pollination can be fruitful to a certain extent. But it seems that certainly self-pollination being automatic and full, this is not the case. And certainly the pollination pollinator deficits that were brought out by um, Bettina and Hosanna point to the same effects in Brazil. And we have similar um, data from Canada. Even so, many agronomists seem to think that pollen magically hops about all by itself, getting from the extrasly opening um, anthers somehow then onto the stigmas by itself. And we just don't know very much about the mechanisms of pollen transfer. How much cross-pollination takes place, we don't really know. How much wind pollination occurs, um, it has been suggested that wind pollination might be important. How much uh, pollination within the same flower, autogamy, all within flowers of the same plant, gaitanogamy, and uh, how much xenogamy or between plants goes on. What are those mechanisms? Um, we do know that outcrossing um, produces higher quality seeds. We get larger seeds with more oil and greater viability if one is interested in, um, in germinating seeds, replanting. Um, so we know that adding managed pollinators to production does improve yields. The numbers from Brazil between uh, uh, 15 and 32 percent are similar to the numbers that have come from other parts of the world, which go from about 10 percent to 20 percent. Um, but like uh, the situation in Brazil, uh, Canadian growers do not routinely add pollinate, uh, pollinators to production. 
Uh, some do, but it's, uh, it's not always the case. So we can ask ourselves the question, as Rosanna's uh, analysis did, how much yield loss can be attributed to what could be considered intentional pollination deficit? And by intentional, I mean the evidence is there that one should put pollinators, manage pollinators onto canola fields, but there is a conscious decision not to do that. So we have pollination for seed production, incomplete pollination in the Salix. This was uh, certainly one of the implications of the more detailed work from Brazil. And larger seeds with more oil with cross-pollination is an important consideration as well. And, and that, of course, gives the uh, ultimate result of greater seed weight. So now if we turn to hybrid seed production, this is an interesting technology. Um, in which Canada has led the world. And this is how, how it's done. Um, hybrid canola seeds are produced on fields which are divided into what are called bays. And one bay uh, has male sterile plants uh, growing in it. Um, and those male sterile plants are going to be the ones that produce the seed, which is harvested then for selling to the growers for the next season. Um, the self-incompatibility can also be used for uh, producing uh, hybrid seeds, but it's not uh, used very much now. So the other bay, the narrower bay in there, is the, uh, the pollinizer plants. These are hermaphrodite flowers on the pollen donors. So those plants then are grown as a source of pollen. So in the, um, in the parlance of uh, plant uh, breeding systems and mating systems, the population on these fields is gynodioecious. The, a lot of the hybrid canola production fields are central pivot irrigation. Uh, they're around 120 acres or 50 hectares in size, so they're large. And there is intensive hybrid seed production on center pivot irrigated lands, in, particularly in southern Alberta. The managed pollinators which are used for making hybrid seed uh, are a mix of honeybees and leaf cutting bees. The honeybees are usually uh, established on the edges of the fields, whereas the leaf cutting bees, because they have short foraging ranges, are put into shelters then within the field and uh, spread throughout the field. So this is the, way, this is the technology which is used. And just to give you an idea of some of the economics, um, the companies in, in Alberta who are producing hybrid seed are spending um, in 2013 about $15 million per year on honeybee pollination plus $15 million per year on leaf cutting bee pollination. So the revenues from this, the uh, production of hybrid seed, it was valued at about 463 million Canadian dollars in 2008. And so we know that that has increased uh, quite a lot since 2008, so up to 2012, 2013. Um, if we look at the cost benefit uh, or the revenue cost uh, ratio on that, um, we've got $463 million worth of seed plus uh, coming from about $30 million worth of pollination, so a 15.2 uh, to 1 ratio. But one has to keep in mind that does not include the costs of land preparation, irrigation, fertilization, crop protection, harvesting, cleaning, and all that sort of thing that has to go into the actual marketing of the hybrid seed to the farmers who are going to grow them. But still, it does give an idea that the value of each female leaf cutting bee is really quite high. It's uh, interesting sort of figures just to think about. Well, we do have a plant population that is gynodioecious, as I pointed out. And so we have the hermaphrodite flowers, which uh, have been described nicely by, uh, by Bettina in terms of how they operate with their extrosely dehiscent anthers, uh, the stigma in the middle, and then down at the base of the flower, then nectaries with abundant nectars. Um, so now when we get to the male sterile plants, there are no anthers, uh, no pollen. 
the stamens themselves are aborted, and the nectaries, which are associated with the bases of the six stamens, are also aborted. So we have uh, uh, an interesting uh, um, con um, matter to deal with for a managed pollinator of which kinds of flowers to visit. Now we know bees are smart, honeybees are smart, bumblebees are smart, and leaf cutting bees, a little bit of work has been done with leaf cutting bees, have shown that they make choices as well. So if a bee is on a hybrid canola seed production field, which kinds of flowers is it going to go to? Well, it's going to the go to the bay, which is the pollinizer bay, because there it will find pollen and there it will find nectar it is not likely to be as keen to visit the bays which are going to produce the seeds because there is very little on those flowers for the bees to gather. There's no pollen and uh, very often very little nectar. Um, so this is a problem uh, that is confronting the uh, industry and is one of the reasons why such high intensity uh, pollination services are required for hybrid seed production. So changing gears a little bit just to sort of introduce some of the can other Canadian oil seeds, uh, mustard is also in the Brassicaceae, the same family as canola, uh, but most of the mustard species which are grown in Canada are actually self-incompatible. So we would assume that there is the necessity for pollination and pollination perhaps uh, would be uh, well served by insects. But also, of course, there might be cross-pollination by the plants jostling together and uh, through the wind. We don't know what the mechanisms of cross-pollination in mustard seed production are. Managed pollinators are not re routinely used. And so we don't know how much yield loss there is through not paying attention and adding pollinators to the production system. Canada produces just about one half of the world's supply of mustard seeds. So several hundreds of thousands of acres, particularly in Saskatchewan and Alberta. So an interesting pollination point of view. Sunflower then in the Asteraceae uh, the old traditional varieties of sunflower were self-incompatible, but plant breeders then have bred self-compatible varieties of sunflower, which are the mainstay of the sunflower seed production industry today. But we can ask again, is self-pollination automatic? And the answer to that is, is generally not. If insects are added to the system, one gets more, bigger, and oilier seeds. And again, we get back to the point that many agronomists that I've spoken to seem to think that if you have a self-compatible plant, that pollen magically hops about all by itself from the anthers onto the stigmas. And although to some extent it might, it certainly doesn't in a, uh, <coughs> in, 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 in to the fullest of the yield that one can get. So how much yield loss can be attributed to intentionally not putting pollinators onto the production fields. One of the areas that we have been exploring in Canada is a, a new technology, well it's not that new anymore, whereby we use bumblebees or honeybees to take biological control agents from their domiciles and take those biological control agents out onto the flowers of the crop. And on the far right, you can see a dispenser. And the, the bees leaving that bumblebee dispenser have to crawl through the tray, which you can see is open. And on the bottom of that tray is the biological control agent in a formulation. And the bees exit from the hive through that tray then and uh, are dusted with the biological control agent, which they then take to the flowers. After they've pollinated, and after they've dispersed the uh, biological control agent, they can go back into their hives, into their domiciles, but they enter through a different, a different channel which keeps them from becoming dusted as they return home. Well, using this technology um, on sunflowers, organically produced sunflowers in Ontario, 
uh, we have been able to uh, very much reduce the incidence of sclerotinia and also work which has been done in North Dakota um, they have been able to show that banded sunflower moth is, uh, is reduced in intensity. The total yield boosts that we have had in Canada, in Ontario, through pollination and protection are up to about 20 to 30 percent. So this is really quite a, a remarkable achievement. This same technology could be applied to uh, canola and also to mustard which also suffer from sclerotinia and from various insect pests. Moving on to safflower, safflower is also in the Asteraceae, um, but all the studies that I've been able to turn up seem to suggest or do suggest that they set seed completely independently of insect pollination. So um, it's perhaps one that uh, one might keep an eye on and see is this a valuable honey plant, etc. But it seems that that's the case. Flax is also um, a plant which is self compatible. It has rather short lived flowers, about one day. And although one gets pollinators on the flowers, feeding on the pollen, and here's a surfid on here, so we get some cross uh, and insect pollination but it's presumed to be unimportant in the production of the seeds which are crushed for then linseed oil. Uh, the plant is also used as a fiber plant, of course, and is the base for the basis for linen. Going on to soybeans, which uh, Bettina mentioned at the beginning, um, soybeans are interesting because when you look at a blooming soybean field, you wouldn't know it was in bloom because the flowers are produced beneath the canopy. They are small purplish or whitish flowers. They're self-pollinating and self-fertile and generally thought to be cleistogamous. So they pollinate themselves right within the flower without the flower really having to open very much. When pollination is complete, one usually gets three seeds per pod. But with pollinating honeybees, one finds that there are more three seeded pods and fewer two seeded pods and two seeded pods are an indication that self pollination has not been complete so one sees then slight increases in yields yield boosts by having more three seeded pods than two seeded pods close to honeybee hives where they have been placed onto soybean fields this does not seem to work for every cultivar of soybean, but in some it does. So again, uh, we can ask the question, would we be able to put honeybees or other bees on soybean fields and get a yield boost that was worthwhile? How much yield loss can be attributed to not putting pollinators onto soybeans? Well, the final one is corn, and we don't need to say very much about corn. We know that uh, honeybees do go to corn to gather the pollen, but uh, corn is wind-pollinated and uh, self-pollinated um, to a large extent, and of course is important for the corn oil industry. So we'll just mention that one for the sake of completion and uh, for the sake of uh, finishing up. So I think we'll now open for uh, anybody who wishes to ask questions. Uh, we'll be ready to go ahead. So thank you so much for your uh, attention. Sorry. Hi. Hello. So, about this question of the reduction of chlorophyll contain basically, we don't have any investigation here, but there are some papers that are showing uh, reduction of chlorophyll with. Uh, pollination by bees, but I, I cannot say specifically uh, so uh, exactly uh, the numbers. Maybe Peter ha can contribute with this answer.
No, I, I don't know of any uh, research done in Canada that uh, has looked at, at that particular issue in terms of quality oil production. So it's, um, it's something to keep in mind uh, from the point of view of, uh, of the quality because I think what, is, what, what happens is the chlorophyll content of the seeds uh, is then pressed out into the oil and of course provides and you don't get the nice yellow oil you get a sort of greenish tint to it. I think that's uh, it's an oil quality um, issue. Okay. About the hoverflies, the surface um, the sylphids are very present in the uh, canola fields here. We tried some time to evaluate how much are these, these flies contributing with the pollination, but was a little bit difficult to, to, to give a, a real, uh, do a, to do a, a experiment because we should uh, isolate the other uh, pollinators, but they are very present here. But if you compare uh, the behavior of the hoverflies with the bees, it's, it's really very different because they are not moving so much uh, into in, the flowers as the bees. In general, the bees uh, seem to be more effective as pollinators. They they can transport more pollen. They they are they have a higher speeds in flight and so and so. Then the hoverflies can contribute, but we cannot say exactly how much. Oh, am I on? Yes. Um, in respect of uh, hybrid canola and a beekeeper's perspective, um, and beekeepers who also want to get a honey crop from uh, from from uh, uh, providing pollination services to hybrid canola production, um, no, I don't know of a list of cultivars uh, that uh, have been shown to give. Uh, nectar and which ones have not. Um, it's a little difficult sometimes to be able to do that sort of thing um, in as much as so much of the hybrid canola production system is a proprietary information to the major companies that are involved in that. Um, and I, I have asked if there's any interest in finding these sorts of things out um, but the, answer has, the answers have not been forthcoming as to whether there's interest or whether there isn't interest or whether the companies are actually doing this themselves. We do know that different cultivars of canola differ in the amount of nectar and particularly the quality of nectar that they produce. And one of the things associated with canola nectar is that when the bees take it back to the hive and make it into honey, that it has a high tendency to granulate. So this can be a bit of a, a handling problem for the beekeepers who are wanting to sell canola honey. Um, and different cultivars do have different, uh, different propensities for granulation. Uh, but the ones that uh, I published on a good number of years ago, a number of those are probably not in production anymore. And uh, it would be very useful if somebody were to repeat that uh, sort of information and also ask the question which has been posed. Thank you. May I, s I say some words about this, Peter? Yes. So, um, about beekeeping and canola, uh, here in, uh, in our state, the canola um, floration, flowering, the canal flowering is during the uh, uh, till to the winter. 
them is a time when the bees have not so many other uh, other plants to to bring nectar and pollen, and then it can be a good sti stimulus to the bees to, to increase the populations of the bees. If you put the if you put the hives in the canola fields, flowering canola fields, you can have your uh, a good stimulus to the increase of the populations. Here, uh, all the cultures that we know here are producing a lot of nectar. It's very clear that the bees are looking for nectar, especially much more than for pollen. But they cannot do so much because it's not the, uh, the right time to do this because it's winter. Then you can combine the uh, beekeeping for the honey production with canola in the context to 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 give a special stimulus for the bees before the right time to to the honey production a little bit later. So it's complicated. It was clear. Yes, I think it's clear, um, and yes, it does depend on, on what state uh, honeybee hives are in as to whether they're going to be particularly interested in uh, gathering pollen or gathering nectar. And uh, certainly in the winter, in the cold weather, uh, thermoregulation and burning up uh, carbohydrates as energy is a very important component of the bees' livelihoods. About uh, about this question of the the colors of the pamphlets, three colors: yellow, white, and and blue. And uh, you and we see you can see that uh, these these values was different. The abundance and the richness of the these species was different between the colors. For example, halicid was more found in blue contracts and uh, apes mellifera was more found in the yellow. So uh, for combining the methodology and uh, about other works in the literature, you can see the all colors uh, combine the whole scenario of the bees in their landscape. That's an end of her answer to that one. Uh, I answered that one on the on the uh, web already. Um, the the um, the answer to that question about the soybean production, uh, Breno Freitas um, at the Federal University in Serra in, Serra in uh, Brazil has some data on soybean fields that, where bees have been deployed and where they have not been deployed. And I think he's published on that. Um, but uh, work that we've done in Canada um, has indicated for some cultivars uh, putting honeybees onto the field didn't make a scrap of difference and uh, for others it did make a, a difference uh, but our experiments were rather small and preliminary and then uh, we weren't able to continue them for lack of funding. Um, we were told by uh, the uh, soybean agronomists that oh, pollination was not important to uh, soybean, that was the immediate reaction without any further discussion. So uh, a bit frustrating. Um, do we have any data on pollination efficiency of native bees in canola in Canada? Um, I don't have any information on that. Uh, I think um, there is some uh, work coming out of Alberta now which is looking at that um, from the University of Calgary 
um, again through some work which has been sponsored by the Canadian Pollination Initiative, but I don't think anything's like that been published. And then there's the work of Laura Morandin that was done at Simon Fraser University a number of years ago that uh, mentions the importance of native bees in canola. Um, but I'm not sure that it goes into the sort of details uh, that perhaps you're looking for on uh, pollination efficiency. You want me to answer that one? Well, I, I can make a comment here because uh, the use of pesticides uh, in canola is, is certainly uh, of concern. Um, and uh, um, where that is going and the severity of the problem, we, we really don't know from a point of view of how those pesticides might be affecting pollinators. Um, so we didn't mention any of this because I don't think we really have um, anything whereby we're able to produce any sort of general conclusion. Um, so uh, it might be something to look into. I don't know of anything. There have been some. There, there has been some interest in looking at the uh, nutritive profile of canola pollen um, because of the huge acreages and the uh, uh, honeybees having, over a period of time, very limited access to other kinds of pollen. I think that was, that was certainly brought out in uh, Rosanna's and Bettina's talk from Brazil, and is also of concern in Canada. But I don't know that canola pollen is rich in any particular kinds of nutrients or is lacking in any particular kinds of nutrients. Um, but I think there, are scientific in, there is some scientific information on that, but I don't, uh, I don't have it at my fingertips. Okay, maybe I can I can tell some a little bit about distinctly bees here because before was a question about uh, wild bees. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have any uh, manage managed uh, leaf cutting bees in Brazil not yet, but we have some species of distinctly bees. And we did some tests last year with some kinds, with some species of stingless bees. And we have so nice results, and we we are trying to publish to organize this data to show that this, this species, the stingless bees, can be good pollinators. Uh, again, they are not so quick and, and uh, so clever as the, the Apis mellifera, but they are good pollinators too. Then it's a, a good, uh, maybe it's a good option to the uh, agricultures that don't want to manage Apis mellifera. They, they can have so smaller canola fields and manage alone or without to, to need to buy services of Aetis mellifera. Well, um put my audio back on and uh, I think uh, we've uh, now spent an extremely fruitful hour 
So thank you very much, Hosanna and Bettina, for your participation and certainly for all the interesting from our attendees. And uh, as has been posted by Victoria, I want to thank her tremendously. She has been the techno guru behind all this and uh, has made it all run so smoothly. And apart from uh, Rosanna handling her uh, being cut off by the computer so well, um, with great aplomb, I might say, um, we, uh, we certainly have done very well. So we are going to, we do put the uh, webinars up on YouTube, so they are available. All three of them will be available uh, once this one goes up. And uh, we are thinking of putting up a fourth uh, webinar, which will have to do with uh, coffee pollination and crop, pro uh, crop protection. But uh, that won't come along until the fall, I suspect. So it'll be a while before we get that organized. So thank you very much all for all your kind attention and, and excellent questions and for the speakers for staying so uh, well on time and being so well organized. Thank you. Thank you so much for the audience. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.